All right, so there are three main uh, mechanisms that we have to regulate enzymatic activity. The first of these is a classification known as inhibition, and you're probably familiarized at least with some of this stuff already. Feedback inhibition is a good example uh, where the end product of a pathway will actually end up inhibiting the first step in that biosynthetic pathway. And the reason that this is really good is that this feedback inhibition enables us to reach some level of optimization uh, very organically. For more like fine-tuning type of methodologies, we have reversible inhibition. For shutting off an enzyme completely, we have irreversible inhibition. And then lastly, allosteric inhibition, which affects the KM and modifies the shape of that sigmoidal curve. Well, what most of this video is going to be about is about covalent modifications, or sometimes called post-translational modification. And then obviously in genetics, you learned about how transcription and translation uh, can control the amount of enzyme that's present in the cell. So the first of these, and really the most important, in my opinion at least, is phosphorylation. And the reason why I think phosphorylation is so important is, well, one, it's, it's extremely anionic, a phosphate molecule is. Um, and this anionic nature of phosphates induces a very, very strong conformational change in the enzyme. It's reversible, and so that's also pretty nice. In that. And you can link the enzymatic cascade that you're working with to the energy state of the cell. And so that's a really, again, a novel way that gives us optimization. Acetylation is more so for like uh, genetics. You'll learn about histone modifications and other things, uh, as with the RNA polymerase modifications that we have taking place. But lipid, attachment of lipid molecules is another great way of covalently modifying enzymatic activity. The only problem with that is that these are irreversible reactions. And so you'll notice that uh, SARC and ROS are not only because of the modifications that are happening to them, but because of the nature of the cascade that they're involved with, these can tend to be associated with certain types of cancers. Gamma carboxylation is also, we'll give an example actually of gamma carboxylation in, uh, in this video. Sulfonation and then ubiquination is a great way of getting your proteasome to just destroy the enzyme completely. Not mentioned in this video though was the role of uh, reactive oxygen species and how they can oxidate uh, disulfide groups or thiol groups to form disulfide bridges. These can induce very, very massive co changes in the protein's conformation and are starting to show some evidence that they're being utilized for signaling cascades for growth factors and other things. Another example that really wasn't listed as a covalent modification per se is the protonation of histidine molecules. As you know, histidine has a pKa of about 6, give or take, and this pKa of about 6 enables it to be within range of certain unique microenvironments that can allow us to put a proton on a histidine. And depending on the context, that can induce a pretty big conformational change in the enzyme that you're working with. So what all of these have in common, specifically though, really the phosphorylation cascades, is the concept of amplification. And so if we were to just, let's say we graph this, this is our time axis, this is our signal axis. Let's say that we're working with a, a signal transduction pathway. Um, starts off really weak and then very quickly grows super, super fast. That's what amplification is. Very rapid and very, very loud signal being sent throughout the cell. Uh, 1 becomes 10, 10 becomes a 100, 100 becomes 1,000, so on and so forth. For intracellular enzymatic activity, we have a lot of advantages. We can put phosphate molecules on, we can take phosphate molecules off. We have compartmentalization um, and a bunch of relative consistency within the cell that enable us to have a bit more leeway in terms of what we want to do. But for the extracellular environment, much of what we have to work with is, is basically not there. It's, it's a chaotic uh, environment. It varies depending on the uh, specific cell type that you're working with. And so proteolytic cleavage is really to extracellular enzymatic regulation what phosphorylation is to intracellular enzymatic regulation. Most proteolytic cascade enzymes are synthesized initially as something called a zymogen. I don't really understand the word origin of the zyme part, but ogen means generators. So for example, the pre-enzyme or pro-enzyme pepsinogen is a pepsin generator. Chymotrypsinogen is a chymotrypsin generator, and so on and so forth. So they'll usually be synthesized in this form, and then after proteolytic cleavage, they'll become these active enzymes. It's not just enzymatic activity, but insulin as well, I think, is, is also adheres to this, uh, this strategy. Okay, so here's an illustration from the textbook of showing, in the case of the GI tract, trypsin, and all the downstream effects of this. So trypsin not only activates all these other enzymes, but it can also play a role in activating itself. Trypsin is the master regulator of a lot of these enzymes. So I want you to think about it. Given the fact that we don't have compartmentalization and we don't have the consistencies that we have, let's say, with uh, intracellular environments, how do we regulate, how do we modify trypsin's activity in an extracellular context? 
Well, if you had guessed an inhibitor, you would have been right. And I'm not just talking about any type of inhibitor, I'm talking about serine protease inhibitors that have a negative 75 kilojoules per mole uh, Gibbs free energy change upon binding. That is, that is more energetically favorable than the hydrolysis of ATP. These things can last, these enzyme inhibitor complexes can last for months on end. Very, 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 very strong inhibition happening. And this example that we give is the lysine here is going to obviously interact with this aspartate at the binding site, and that's going to induce a very, very strong uh, enzyme inhibitor complex. This is really, really important though because autodigestion is, is a pretty big problem in certain types of diseases and plays a role in a lot of pathologies. To give an example, people who, let's say, they have the, the uh, in this case, it's the antitrypsin, so if we were to go back here, we know that trypsin plays a role in the conversion of proelastase to elastase, and elastase is, plays a, a large role in maintaining connective tissue properties, but if you overactivate elastase, you're going to end up getting destruction of your connective tissue. And in people who either have a genetic defect where they're lacking that inhibitor, or they're smokers and they oxidize their inhibitor and it can't bind as well with that negative 75 kilojoules per mole uh, binding energy, elastase is going to remain in the active state longer than it should be and that's going to result in degradation of the tissue, in this case of the lungs, leading to emphysema. I, I don't know why this is a shock to you. Smoking is bad, kids.